Hello and welcome here to our second video in week five of Transforming Truths. In the first video, we talked about uh, Protestant soteriology to understand better how historically Protestants have em emphasized uh, salvation by faith, which of course is accomplished through what Jesus did on the cross. And in this week here, we are diving uh, in more specifically into the topic of the atonement. So this is my overview here. Uh, we'll talk about three things. First, the meaning of the word atonement. Uh, and then we'll talk about different views on the atonement. And finally, I'll briefly say something about the significance of the atonement. So, defining the word atonement, I've got this quote here from a rather recent book uh, with the title Atonement, published in 2018, where it says the Oxford English Dictionary defines atonement as the action of setting at one or condition of being set at one after discord or strife. The etymology of atonement is at one meant. And, and so this is something that, that Todd has also been emphasizing in his teaching. So I wanted to come back to this point that the, the word one is literally at the center of the word atonement, right? It's bringing together into one two entities that were formerly separated. Uh, so the author here continues to say, however, when I first happened upon this fact, I did not believe it. For many speakers of English, the word has come to be strongly associated with images of suffering. To atone is to undergo some kind of pain or sacrifice for wrongful acts. A demand for atonement is usually perceived as threatening, a demand for punishment rather than a call to the resumption of friendly relations. So we can see here that in, in some of the newer reflections on the atonement, there is a move away from the idea of punishment and more a move towards the restoration of relationships. So we could say it's a more relationship-based or organic view of the atonement. Now here, a more traditional view of the atonement would say that the meaning of the atonement lies in the following, that by the atonement is meant that action of Christ's death, which has a prime regard to God's holiness, has it for its first charge and finds man's reconciliation impossible, except as that holiness is divinely satisfied once for all on the cross. So here you would have a, a more traditional view in a book like the Cruciality uh, of the cross, which will be in your optional readings, where it says that, yes, of course, the cross is about reconciliation, but because there's an emphasis on God's holiness and uh, the, the sin of humanity, there is more of a focus on, on the satisfaction theory that, that God's wrath uh, is against any kind of sin and that therefore there had to be a sacrifice in our place and Jesus fulfilled that sacrifice in in a, a perfect way by by shedding his blood so you can see already with these two quotes that different uh, Christians have different views on the atonement and that has also historically been true so that is not only been true for the last few decades or so but for quite some time throughout church history, there have been different emphases. And so uh, I got this overview here from Todd. So some of the following fly slides are actually provided by Todd. So I'm, I'm grateful for the work he did there. So for him, he, he summarizes the three main views on the atonement as follows. First, the first main view is that Christ is primarily conquering evil and evil powers on the cross. So that is the Christus Victor view. And then the second main view is that Christ is primarily accomplishing reconciliation between us and God on the cross by satisfaction and or substitution. 
and it understands the cross in biblical terms as both sacrifice and as an offer of forgiveness. Uh, that is a view that became prominent in the Protestant Reformation, as we've seen, and, and is uh, prominent among many evangelicals today. And then the third main view is that Christ is primarily setting a motivating moral example for us on the cross, either of the love we should imitate, uh, meaning it's a positive example, or of the punishment of God's wrath on human sin, a negative example that we should avoid. And so uh, one way of looking at it is this, using this chart that uh, talks about the three main views and then emphasizes here that if you look at different books by different authors, they, they will describe these views in one way or the other. So the books listed here are what Christians believe and then across the spectral, the book that you are quite familiar with by now, and then Christian uh, theology reader by Alistair McGrath, who's quite a prominent author for theology books and so what what all these books do is they do mention the uh, christus victor view which is about primarily conquering evil and evil power so there's an ancient uh, christus victor view that goes back to the very beginning of church history and a more current christus victor view that many evangelicals hold today and there's also other ways to describe this view, such as ransom theory, because in the Christus Victor view, there's a certain emphasis on the role that the devil plays as, as the one who is uh, the prince of this world and has taken humanity captive. And in some mysterious way, Jesus pays the price for us as human captives on the cross, and uh, that is how we were redeemed. Um, and so then there's this other view, the accomplishing reconciliation between God and humanity that emphasizes uh, the reconciliation in terms of a, a legal framework, which is why often people talk about the penal substitution view. And then there is the view where it's talking about a motivating example to you, humanity. And you can see that uh, the, the moral dimension of it here is a key word as we have the, either the moral example view or the moral government view. And I'm not going to get through all of this. Uh, you can look at it later in, in the PowerPoint by yourself and study this and the following chart in more detail. And we can also uh, make this a topic, of course, uh, for the discussion time. But in this chart, we still have these three categories, right? So there's three main views. There's the Christus Victor view. There's the view that emphasizes reconciliation, and then there's the one that emphasizes the example. Uh, but here now we have our five categories as five major seasons in church history, starting with the ancient church and then the medieval church in, in the Middle Ages and the Reformation church with key figures like Martin Luther and John Calvin that we also mentioned in the first video. And then there's uh, the modern church and here, interestingly, you can see that in the modern church, there has been a move away from the traditional Christus Victor uh, view and also from the traditional um, penal substitution view. So you can see there's no major examples here, but they uh, focus somewhat more on, uh, on the, uh, providing a motivating example to humanity view. Uh, and uh, yeah, and then the last one uh, in the contemporary church again examples for all three uh, views here and so yeah i think uh one takeaway from this can be that the atonement is a complex topic you could think of it as a diamond that you can look at it from different uh sides and here for example we have the example of augustine uh, one of the greatest theologians of all times and he's uh here in the middle category emphasizing that the cross accomplished reconciliation between God and humanity, but he also held uh, the other two views. So that can also be a source of inspiration for us to examine the biblical basis for all of these three views and to be able to benefit from all of these perspectives. Having said that, it could be also a little bit confusing to have all these different views. So here's gonna be my take on it from an evangelical and Pentecostal perspective. So. From an evangelical perspective, I will say that I think evangelicals do a good job in 
uh, describing Christ as the savior from sin. Uh, they have an emphasis on the penal substitutionary atonement, which means they uh, emphasize the legal judicial framework uh, that focuses on human guilt. And so their message is Christocentric and crucicentric, which means they, it focuses on Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. And so I think the strength of this view is that it does a good job in, in you know, preaching the basics of the gospel to, to people that, that we human beings are sinners, that we need a savior. Maybe they, they call people to, to be born again or to have a conscious experience where they say, okay, yes, I put my trust now in, in Jesus as, as my savior. So I think that is a strength uh, within the evangelical uh, movement. At the same time, I think it's not everything and the, the Pentecostal movement may be able to add to some of this. So it, in the Pentecostal understanding, I think there's more of an understanding that Christ is the conqueror of all evil, defeating the devil, demons, and the consequences of sin. Uh, for example, that would include uh, sickness. Uh, and so the Pentecostal view would be more of a holistic view that emphasizes a transformation. It's a life-giving uh, view that, uh, for example, says that, you know, since Christ is conquering all of evil, since he's not only savior, but also a baptizer in the Holy Spirit and healer and soon coming king, uh, that is a, one ways of how Jesus, one of the ways how uh, Pentecostals describe Jesus. Uh, so for all these reasons, it is more comprehensive. And one of the things that uh, some Pentecostals emphasize is that healing is in the atonement, right? Something that we see in Matthew 8. If you want to go there in Matthew 8, there's a passage where Jesus is healing many sick people and also driving out demons. And then it says, this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. So interestingly, that very passage from Isaiah 53 that was also important to Martin Luther in terms of forgiveness of sins, as we've seen in the first uh, video, uh, the case can also be uh, made that Jesus is not only taking care of the sin problem, but also of the sickness problem. Um, so some of these views uh, are explained in Stephen M. Studebaker's new book, The Spirit of Atonement, Pentecostal Contributions and Challenges to the Christian Traditions. And uh, he has a focus on the Holy Spirit, so we could call it pneumatocentric, although he avoids that because he says he's still very much focusing on Jesus, on, on what Jesus accomplished, accomplished. It's just that he does so from the perspective of Pentecost. And with that, I'm closing uh, by emphasizing the significance of the atonement. So one way we can see the significance is that the depictions of Jesus on the cross is something that have inspired artists uh, in the 2000 years of church history and in different cultures. And now that the church is growing, especially in Africa, Latin America and Asia, and many of the believers in those areas are Pentecostal, maybe not classical Pentecostals, but Pentecostals in the sense that they emphasize the work of the Spirit, they emphasize deliverance, they emphasize uh, healing, they, they emphasize transformation. Uh, and I think that that can be an important source for us to also reconsider how we look at the topic of the cross and of the atonement. Um, here is a, Another quote from an evangelical author, Erickson, who wrote Christian Theology and says, the most recognizable symbol of Christianity is the cross. Just think of all the art, again, that has been made with the cross at its center. And one of the earliest depictions of the cross is actually this kind of cartoon that probably a young Roman student wrote to make uh, fun of one of his classmates. It's called the Alexamenos Graffito, because here we have a depiction of Jesus with uh, uh, the head of a donkey, so making fun of Jesus on the cross and the person that is worshiping this so-called God that in the Roman understanding could not possibly be a God. And there's an inscription in Greek which says, Alexamenos worships his God. Uh, so just a reminder of what a disgrace it was for Jesus to die on the cross and a reminder for us how important that was. And also to understand there is still a mystery to that. And we might 
never fully understand it.